Hello and welcome to Lie Algebras. In this lecture, lecture number 17, we will talk about the Casimir element. Our usual setup is that we consider a semi-simple, finite dimensional complex Lie algebra G and denote by U of G the universal enveloping algebra of G. Consider the Killing form K on G. So this is a symmetric bilinear form and since G is semi-simple, we know that it is even non-degenerate. Fix some basis of G and let it be xi, where i runs from 1 to n. Since we have a non-degenerate bilinear form, we automatically have the dual basis in G, which is defined using the requirements that the value of the killing form at the pair xi and the element yj in the dual basis is equal to the Kronecker delta i j. So now we can define the Casimir element. The Casimir element C is defined as the element of u of g given by the expression the sum i from 1 to n of x i times y i. So this is a quadratic expression. So this element does not belong to the Lie algebra g, but it belongs to the universal enveloping algebra u of g. So this element C is called the Casimir element in honor of Hendrik Casimir, who constructed such elements back in 1931. As an example, consider the Lie algebra SL2 with a standard basis F, H, and E. It is easy to compute that the dual basis with respect to the Killing form consists of E divided by 4, H divided by 8, and F divided by 4. Therefore, we can now compute that the Casimir element is equal to EF divided by 4 plus H squared divided by 8 plus FE divided by 4. So if we move out the scalar 1 divided by 8, we have in the bracket the expression 2EF plus 2FE plus H squared, which we can rewrite using the fact that EF is equal to FE plus H as 4fe plus h squared plus 2h. And now adding and subtracting 1, we can get in the bracket the expression 4fe plus h plus 1 squared, which we used heavily in our study of simple finite dimensional SL2 modules in the previous lectures. The main theorem of today's talk is the fact that the Casimir element belongs to the center of the universal enveloping algebra. Before proving this theorem, let us discuss the independence of the Casimir element of the choice of a basis in G. If we look at the definition, then we clearly see that C is defined as an expression of elements in a given basis. However, the claim is that this outcome does not depend on the choice of the basis. So during the proof, we will consider elements of the given basis as a column vector. Let A be the transformation matrix from our basis X to some other basis X prime. Denote by B the transformation matrix from the dual basis Y of X to the dual basis Y prime of X prime. The fact that the basis is Y prime and x prime are dual to each other translates into the equality that the transpose of b is equal to the inverse of a. Also note that the Casimir element c is defined as a trace of the matrix x y transpose. Now we are going to use the fact that the trace of the product of two matrices does not depend on the order of the factors. Let us now compute the Casimir element C prime associated to the basis X prime. So this is a trace of the product X prime times Y prime transpose. We use that X prime is AX and Y prime is BY to rewrite this as a trace AX BY transpose. So now we can write BY transpose as Y transpose times B transpose. And now in this product, we consider this as a product of A with the remaining factors. And we use that the trace of xy is equal to the trace of yx 
to move A all the way to the right. So we have trace X, Y transposed, B transposed A, and now we can use that B transposed is A inverse just to cancel the last two factors. What is left is a trace of X, Y transposed, which is exactly the original Casimir element. So this completes the proof of our proposition. Also, to prove our main result, we will need the following useful lemma. Assume that we are given some element g of our Lie algebra, and let us fix some element i in the indexing set of our basis. Consider the Lie bracket xi with g, and let us write this as a linear combination of the elements in the basis xj with coefficients aij. Similarly, consider the Lie bracket of g with yi, and write it as a linear combination of yj's with coefficients bij. The claim of the lemma is that aij is equal to bji for all i and j. To prove this, we recall that the killing form k is associated. By definition, the element aij, which is the coefficient of this Lie bracket at xj, can be computed at the value of the killing form for this bracket and the element yj, because x and y form a dual basis. Now the associativity of k means that we can move the Lie bracket from the left to the right. And this expression is equal to the killing form between xi and the Lie bracket of g and yj. And using the expression for the Lie bracket between g and yj, we conclude that this value is equal to bji. And this is exactly what was claimed. So now we are ready to prove the main theorem. So we need to prove that the element c commutes with each element g in the Lie algebra g. So let us compute the product c times g. First, we use the definition of c and write it as a sum over all i from 1 to n of xi times yi times g. Let us move g to the left past yi. So we can do this, but then the price to pay is the commutator between yi and g. So now we have g in the middle. We move it again to the left past xi, and the price we pay is the commutator between xi and g. Also, in the second term of the previous expression, we use the anti-commutativity of the Lie bracket, and instead of the bracket of y, i, and g, we write the bracket of g and y, i. So now we have moved g all the way to the left, and the first summon of this expression is g times c. So in order to prove that c g is equal to g times c, we need to prove that the second and the third summons, that they cancel each other. For this, we will use the claim of the lemma from the previous slide. So we compute the second summon. The sum over all i, the bracket of xi with g times yi. So the bracket of xi with g can be written as a sum over all j's, aij times xj. Now, using the claim of the lemma, we can rewrite aij as bji and see that this sum can be now written as a sum over all j, xj times g bracket with yj. And now we can also change the index in our sum from i to j to get exactly the last term in the previous expression. So the second term and the third term are equal and so they cancel each other in this expression. This completes the proof of the main theorem. The main property of the Casimir element is the following theorem, which we will need in the next lecture. Let V be a simple finite dimensional G module. Then the Casimir element C acts on V as a scalar. Let's denote the scalar by theta. Moreover, the scalar theta is a non-negative real number, and it is zero, if and only if V is a trivial G module. Proof. The fact that C acts on V as a scalar follows directly from Schur's lemma because we just established that C belongs to the center of the universal enveloping algebra and V is a simple module. Clearly, the element C kills the trivial module because it's a linear combination of products of elements in G 
and all elements in G kill the trivial module. It remains to prove that the scalar with which C acts on non-trivial simple finite dimensional G modules is a positive real number. For any positive root alpha, we fix an SL2 triple F alpha, H alpha, and E alpha in G. Denote by H upper alpha, where alpha is an element in our fixed basis pi, the basis of the Cartan sub algebra, which is dual to the basis consisting of elements H lower alpha, with respect to the Killing form K. Note that from the construction of the Casimir element, it follows directly that the element C is a linear combination of the expressions of the form f alpha e alpha plus e alpha f alpha and the sum over all alpha in p h lower alpha times h upper alpha so it's a linear combination of such expressions with positive real coefficients also note that f alpha e alpha plus e alpha f alpha can be rewritten as h alpha plus 2 times f alpha e alpha so this is because EF is equal to FE plus H. So now let lambda be a highest weight of our module V, that is a weight such that lambda plus alpha is not a weight for any positive root alpha. So such weight clearly exists because V is finite dimensional and so it has only finitely many weights. Then directly from the definition, it follows that each E alpha kills V lambda so in particular, the product F alpha E alpha kills V lambda. Also note that from our identification of the H and its dual using the killing form, it follows easily that the linear combination of H sub alpha H upper alpha acts on V lambda as the scalar, the scalar product of lambda with itself. And since the killing form on the Cartan subalgebra is positive definite, this is a non-negative real number. So this scalar is just the evaluation of lambda at this sum. Note also that the element H alpha acts on V lambda as a scalar lambda of H alpha. And using the SL2 theory, we know that the highest weights of all simple finite dimensional SL2 modules are exactly the non-negative integers. In particular, they are greater than or equal to zero. Since V is now assumed to be a non-trivial module, the highest weight associated to V is clearly non-zero. So in particular, this means that the scalar product of lambda with itself is strictly greater than zero. So our scalar is a linear combination with some positive real coefficients of the positive real number, the scalar product of lambda with itself, and then a negative real number, the sum over all alpha in phi plus lambda of h alpha. So this is clearly positive. So this completes the proof of this theorem on the previous slide. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the lecture.